This week on The Anxious Truth, we're going to take a look at the common threads or themes that run through what might seem like a wide range of anxious and anxiety-related fears, so let's get at it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode 291 of the podcast, recorded in May of 2024. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. I'm a therapist in training, specialization in anxiety and anxiety disorders, author and educator, a podcaster in the mental health and anxiety community, and a former sufferer of anxiety disorders and depression on and off for many years of my life. If this is your first time here listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, welcome. I hope you find the content useful in some way. And if you do, consider adding the podcast to your library of favorite podcasts, or maybe subscribing to my YouTube channel. Of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. I'm glad you're here this week. A few weeks ago, I asked my Instagram audience to list three words or short phrases that best represent the anxious or anxiety driven fears they are struggling with right now. A few hundred people responded, so we had oh, about 750 words or phrases submitted, and the results are very interesting. Now, of course, this was not really a scientific thing, and remember that I am always addressing a subset of the population that struggles with chronic or disordered forms of anxiety, so keep that in mind as we go forward today. But when we get a few hundred chronically anxious people to tell you what they fear, and the results are this homogeneous, it's kind of worth talking about. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder, as I offer every week, that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode and this YouTube video. I've written three books on anxiety and anxiety recovery. I've created a bunch of inexpensive psychoeducational workshops designed to help you understand the basic principles of anxiety disorders and recovery. There are all the previous podcast episodes and videos, which are naturally free. And there is the absolute mountain of content I've created on my social media content channels for the years, like Instagram and Facebook. All of these resources can be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com. So if you'd like to see or learn more, check that out. And remember to use the search tool on my website. It should point you to pretty much whatever you're looking for. So check it out. Now, among people that struggle with chronic or disordered forms of anxiety, there are a wide range of individual primary fears or concerns. When you ask a large enough number of our friends what they're afraid of, you're going to get a pretty wide range of answers, primarily because... Everyone experiences fear and worry and concern and anxiety in a slightly different way. And in this little non-scientific experiment, we find that anxious people, peers, express a very wide range of primary anxious fears. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to put a software-generated word cloud up on the screen for you to check out. I can't list every one of the individual responses, or we would be here for hours. But here's a sample of primary anxious fears that people expressed in our experiment. Death, going crazy, passing out, psychosis, having a heart attack, going insane, becoming depressed, fainting, never getting better, being embarrassed, vomiting, losing control, hurting their kids, schizophrenia, choking, not being able to cope, not being able to handle things, fear about the future, feeling like a failure feeling that the feelings themselves will never stop, there's always serious illness, medical emergency, being hospitalized, suffocation, dizziness, blood pressure, feeling unreal, feeling detached from oneself, dry mouth, having the symptoms forever, and needing to get to a bathroom. Among many, I can't list every one of them. I could go on and list every response, but there were quite a few of them. Now, the software that I use to run this little experiment groups answers together and creates what's called a word cloud, where the most common answers are displayed in large type in the center of the cloud, and less common or even singular answers are in smaller type near the edges. The biggest words right at the middle of the cloud, and this is probably not going to be a surprise, were death, crazy, passing out, heart attack, dying, loss of control, psychosis, suicide, cancer, going insane, breathing, and embarrassment. So what do this word cloud and all these fear words and phrases tell us? 
what can we learn from this? What I really want to point out today is how so many varied and individual responses when we grouped them together show us common threads and themes that run throughout community. You might be afraid of a heart attack or suffocation, or you may interpret anxiety symptoms and fear as indicating an actual immediate physical or medical threat. Pick a physical sensation or urgent medical emergency that you fear but anxious or triggered. It almost doesn't really matter what that specific emergency even is. It falls under the category of immediate medical danger. Anxiety creates physical sensations in our bodies. Among people struggling with chronic anxiety or anxiety disorders, these sensations might be interpreted as indicating immediate medical threat or emergency. So welcome to common theme number one. Common theme number two is similar, but it focuses on immediate psychological or mental emergency or disaster. This is seen in responses that point at a fear of psychosis or insanity, losing control, or becoming stuck in a highly anxious or dissociated state forever. There are lots of words and phrases that speak to this common thread, so it might look like there are so many different anxious fears. But for those that live in dread of being sort of mentally broken by extreme anxiety or panic, however way it's described, this is, according to our little unscientific word cloud, the second most common thread or theme found in anxious or anxiety-driven fears. The physical sensations and the tidal wave of thoughts and mental emotions and internal experiences are often interpreted by anxious people as indicating an immediate threat to one's mental, cognitive, or emotional well-being. So here we have common theme number two. Common thread or theme number three is its own thing, but it's also related to the first two themes we pointed out. In this common theme, the central concept is the fear of sort of not being able to cope with the experience of anxiety or being somehow overwhelmed by it. This might be interpreted physically, mentally, emotionally, or maybe even socially. But in the end, this thread is all about physical sensations, thoughts, and emotions being too much, dangerous, or capable of creating uncontrollable, disastrous outcomes. Anxious people that fear that they will embarrass themselves are expressing the fear of not being able to handle that embarrassed feeling. Our friends that fear that they will never get better or return to sort of previous anxiety-related struggles are saying that they fear being unable to adequately cope with how they feel and what they experience when triggered. People that fear physical or mental incapacitation are expressing the belief that their bodies and brains will be overwhelmed by anxiety and fear and will break in some way leading to a horrible outcome like maybe death or a permanent psychotic state. If, for instance, you fear bathroom-related accidents or vomiting, you will want to insist that these are practical, justifiable fears that fall outside the scope of the usual approach to anxious fears, but you are really expressing a strong belief that these experiences are absolutely intolerable and represent unhandleable disasters from which there can be no recovery or rebound. It's too much, it's unhandleable, it will be overwhelming. And our last common thread that I kind of want to point out from our word cloud will be familiar to anyone dealing with OCD or health anxiety or really even GAD, because I tend to argue that there's very little difference between GAD, health anxiety, and OCD from an operational standpoint, even though, yes, these are in fact different diagnoses, because this common theme in anxious fear is based on becoming fixated on or obsessed with specific outcomes or problems. Now, often these outcomes are not immediate like they are in the first two common themes. They may be framed as future constructs, things that might happen later at a specific time or at even some undefined point in the future. We see these in our word cloud when our friends express fear about engaging in acts of harm or self-harm being unsure about their true sexual orientation, or having an undiagnosed serious medical issue, or maybe developing a serious medical issue at some point in the future. The specific nature of these problems or perceived problems leads to mental or behavioral issues or compulsions that are designed to sort of alleviate the discomfort associated with fearing that outcome. Continued researching, asking for reassurance, rethinking and reanalyzing things, we call that rumination, common examples of this. Now, as always, now we see four common fears that are spread across a wide range of anxious fears. We always want to look at how we can use this information. How does it help us? How might you apply this in your own recovery efforts? 
Well, the way I see it, there are two primary takeaways that I can identify. The first is an age old saying, you are not alone. And this, as you can see, is true. People who are new to all of this often see themselves as uniquely broken or dealing with sensations, thoughts, or beliefs that no one else has. They feel really alone in this struggle and they might draw the false conclusion that they are actually beyond hope or that no one else on the planet shares their experience. I mean, even people who have been at this for a while can begin to think that the length of their struggle is unique and that nobody else could possibly be having the same issues that they're having for as long as they've been having them. In these situations, knowing that you are not alone in your experience can be encouraging, it can be motivating, it's definitely reassuring. Sometimes this kind of thing can even provide a measure of hope or optimism that might otherwise be really difficult to access. The second takeaway that I might suggest from this episode is more practical in nature. If you see your anxious fears through a specific lens and have been working hard to address the specific content that frightens you, how might this change based on knowing what we know now? You may be spending your days trying to determine how to overcome shortness of breath in air quotes or air quotes, how to detect or prevent cancer. You may be laser focused on your particular OCD theme and working overtime to maybe prove that you won't harm someone or that you really do love your partner or that you're not a horrible person. If you could step away from the specifics and recognize the larger theme at play, what might happen? In the process of overcoming chronic and disordered anxiety, we look for a recovery process that is more durable and long lasting because lessons learned in one context, say fear of a heart attack, for example, are applied across multiple contexts, like maybe fear of never getting better or fear of not sleeping. And if we lose sight of the bigger picture and remain narrowly focused on the specific content of our worry and fear, we run the risk of trying to improve our lives only by learning how to deal with individual obstacles that then seem to continually morph and change on us over time. If you see recovery as the act of becoming absolutely certain about your status as a good person, or your future relationship with anxiety and fear, you may wind up frustrated and confused when solving those fears only leaves you with others that have popped up in their place, which is a very common experience in our community. So what can we do? Stop for just a minute or two. Zoom out a little bit. Notice that you are not the only one having these experiences, and then you have to at least consider the possibility that progress might be found in stepping away from the specifics of your fear and instead working on your relationship with fear and uncertainty themselves. When someone asks me, for example, for tips on air hunger, I am often heard to say that it's not actually about air hunger, it's about learning to get better at being worried and afraid. This is why I say such ridiculous sounding things every day. Our word cloud experiment is a good example of this concept in action. So that is episode 291 of The Anxious Truth in the books. You know it's over because, wait for it, music. I hope you found at least some of this helpful in some way. Of course, if you find the podcast or YouTube channel helpful or interesting in general, you can take a moment to subscribe on YouTube, rating or review for the podcast, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or whatever app you're listening on. These things really do help other people find the content and maybe get the help they need. They're also just a really free, easy way to support the work that I do. I appreciate that you were here today. Thank you so much for spending time with me. And I'm going to remind you, like I always do, that no matter how small your steps forward might be today, they count, they add up. Take the lessons you learn as you learn them. Tiny steps that are hard to take teach us big lessons. Keep going, hanging in there, and I will see you 